highly conducive for entrepreneurs and businesses. There's an opportunity which exists for Indian sellers to get their products to the global markets and to do it in a few simple steps. To understand this opportunity better from an investor's perspective, we are very delighted to have with us here today, Anjali Bansal. Uh, Anjali Bansal is the founder of Avana Capital, which invests in and provides scaling up support to innovation-led startups for catalyzing impact at scale while delivering commercial returns. Anjali has invested in and mentored various successful startups, including Delivery, Urban Clap, Darwin Box, Nika, and Lenskart. She's closely associated with Niti Ayog's Women on entrepreneurship platform, digital solutions, and mentor to the Atal Innovation Mission. Anjali is the formal non-executive chairperson of Dena Bank, appointed by the government of India to steer the resolution of the stressed bank, eventually leading to merger with Bank of Baroda. She was earlier a global partner and managing director with TPG Growth PE responsible for India, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Middle East. She started her career as a strategy consultant with McKenzie and Co. in New York. Welcome to the forum, Anjali. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Sinchita. I'm delighted to be here. And very importantly, I'm a long-standing Thai charter member. So it is wonderful to be back here with the Thai family. Awesome. Great. Uh, so let's get started, Anjali. We can't wait to ask you a bunch of questions, right? So uh, firstly, I want to ask you, Anjali, you know, you've been a big believer in entrepreneurship, right? But you, how have you really seen the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem evolve over the last six to eight years? What has essentially changed? It's a great question, Sinchita. I think there's so much change that has taken place in India period, and particularly in sort of the world of entrepreneurship in the last 20 years. So if I go back to say 2000, it was something that was kind of fringe and very niche and you had to be a true um, sort of maverick to do something entrepreneurial versus taking a nice job at a McKinsey company, right? So uh, what has changed in the last six, seven, eight years is entrepreneurship is an absolutely legitimate career option. And we are seeing a lot of young people um, either join startups in jobs or just quit their jobs and say, I'm going to create something new and innovative. So that's one. Uh, the quality of people, the number of people who are taking entrepreneurship as a career option. The second is availability of capital. There is a lot more capital available today to support entrepreneurial journeys at every stage. So you have now organized angel groups, there is seed funding, series A, series B, the venture funds are there here. And interestingly now late stage venture, late stage growth funds are also here. So there's a lot more capital that's available. And third is the kind of change taking place in our macro system. So the emergence of folks like Amazon and your support for entrepreneurs and micro entrepreneurs uh, and government initiatives to create the digital infrastructural rails. Take UPI, for example. So the kind of fintech models that are being built today could not have been possible five years ago in the absence of India stack and Aadhaar based KYC and UPI. So a lot has changed in entrepreneurship, but I, I think it is, the time has never been better uh, to leverage the and harness the power of entrepreneurship, new ideas and innovation, and apply it to solving some of our biggest problems at scale. Thanks, Anjali. I think you put it up really well, uh, highlighted all the aspects, uh, and, and I think all the entrepreneurs here are listening. Right. Um, so also, you know, I want to get into the topic now, Anjali, you know, since you're talking about building global businesses um, and we've seen many Indian brands make it big in global marketplaces. Right. So I want to ask you, what is the kind of potential that specifically Indian businesses have and, and you know, how can they harness it fully? So let me break it up into two or three pieces. Right. So one is we've had longstanding Indian brands. Tata Group has many global brands. Uh, there's Tata T, Tetley, Jaguar Land Rover, et cetera. So you can build global businesses, even if they're not necessarily first generation and so on. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of consumer product companies that also have global brands like say Americo. Um, more recently, I think I would, let, let me split it into two. There are uh, technology or enterprise SaaS type companies where the big markets are really global. And then there are consumer companies, much like what Meghna has and Ashish and so on. And you may start with India and uh, your consumer product brand may be more relevant for India, but it can be expanded into adjacent markets and eventually into global markets where there is, uh, where we are seeing actually a lot of opportunity already, not just potential, but immediate opportunity is an enterprise technology and enterprise SaaS. We have seen very successful companies, uh, Freshdesk, um, Postman, 
uh, Zolo and some of the younger ones like Darwin Box and Vimo and so on actually start with an India base, but very quickly be able to go global. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the key sectors as well, Anjali. Uh, now I want to ask you a very interesting question, which I am like really interested to know, you know, so uh, you have invested in startups which have got the unicorn status today, right? So how do you look at companies to see if they have the unicorn potential? What are the key signs to look out for? I'm sure, you know, even investors want to really listen to this um, perspective from you. See, we only know the ones who make it big. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know the ones who don't make it big. Uh, but I, I first, first and foremost want to say, I think we have to respect all entrepreneurs, whether they become unicorns or not, because it is very, very hard to be an entrepreneur. And there's, it takes enormous amounts of courage uh, and hard work and commitment. So I want to appreciate all entrepreneurs, whether unicorn or not. Um, I wish I could say that I knew then that they would be unicorns. I just knew that they are aiming to solve a problem, which is a big problem. So there's a large addressable market. Mm. It is a big problem to be solved. And these are very smart, very committed, terrific people. So ultimately, you know, at that stage, you take a bet on the on what's the kind of problem and the total market, and then the entrepreneurs themselves. And they say, yes, they can, they'll figure it out. Even if this is not the first model that they start with, they'll evolve and then all of them have evolved in their business models. But basically they'll figure it out and they'll execute really well. An we execution know. is multiple things, right? Execution is not just doing it all yourself, building a great team, building the right technology, raising the right capital. Uh, a lot of that has to come together. No, absolutely. Thanks for, you know, bringing that perspective that we must respect all entrepreneurs. I can't agree more. It's the hardest job in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Anjali. Um, so, uh, you know, my next question to you is... Um, what is your what would your personal advice be you know to entrepreneurs who've joined the discussion today and you know who are probably looking to create global brands and you know sell their made in india products throughout the world so what would what would your advice advice be there so first and foremost think hard about why you want to do this i've said this before entrepreneurship is really hard by the way it's also very exciting which is why so many of us choose to be entrepreneurs so there's a lot of excitement. Uh, when you're building a global brand, think about what market are you solving for first? If you're truly solving for the US market, then design a product and a go-to market that addresses the US market. Mm. If you're starting with the India market, then your product has to first get your POC, your proof of concept here, your product market fit has to work, your business model has to work in the Indian context. Um, so very different ways that you build first for the world versus building first for India. A lot of companies have done the build for India and then export to the world. Mm. Absolutely fine. You can do that as well. And there are others who have said, you know, we are fundamentally a tech product. Our market is not in India. So we are actually going to build for export. And in which case you build those uh, POCs with global customers, with you build a global team, you create your sales team and you create early alliances that help you access those markets as well. And similarly, who you raise capital from also becomes an important decision. And, and, and I would urge you to make it a thoughtful, proactive decision versus a reactive default. Um, think about funds and investors who can help you access markets and access clients in addition to giving you money. So for example, if you want to go to Southeast Asia, then uh, a fund that has a Southeast Asia presence that has helped other businesses built in Southeast Asia is useful. Whereas if you're building a core consumer product for India, then people who understand the Indian consumer market, who know what the brand journey is, can help you build that along with providing you capital that is more important. Thanks, Anjali. I, th I think the key message is, you know, to think it through. And that's something which even, you, you know, we've heard. Uh, we also tell uh, the business that we work with, right? Sometimes it's just not aligned and it's just as an experiment. So so thanks for that. Uh, okay, I'm coming to the last question. And, you know, I want to talk about challenges. Uh, no entrepreneurship journey uh, is without any challenges, right? So, and, and one cha uh, challenge which all entrepreneurs face today is uh, access to capital. You've spoken about it before, you know, today itself. Uh, but in the VC sector, right? Uh, Anjali, how do you see that panning out? How has it changed? I think there's a lot of capital available actually today. There's more capital than before. The 
the the pace of seed series a funding has actually accelerated during covid lockdown and uh, there is more even more enthusiasm for digital first models so as an entrepreneur if you are in your first proof of concept phase get to market quickly get something going raise a little bit of capital from friends and family from angels um is what i would suggest from the vc point of view i think it's it's hard work being a vc these days because the best investments the best entrepreneurs the best deals are very competitive so it's actually a great time to be an entrepreneur Thanks. see i can see ashish and meghna smiling there <laughs> because you see they've had to turn away a lot of investors who wanted to invest and they said sorry no more room <laughs> I think that's an interesting conversation to have you know we should have yeah. this from that perspective we should have a yeah. session specifically on that yeah. perspective also mm -hmm. uh, so but thank tell you is something specific around access to capital that is useful for our entrepreneurs on the uh, in the session today and i can address that I think you've made uh, you know you've given us uh, the bigger picture uh, here uh, I think you know uh, so I, I mean I did not know that during the covid-19 uh, pandemic like more avenues have opened up so um, I think it answers the broader uh, question and we have certain mm -hmm. specific questions uh, which have come in as well and we can you know get to that So thank thank you Anjali I think it was indeed uh, you know a short a burst of enlightenment session with you here today uh, we have some audience question like I said uh, uh, and we've taken out two of those today like we had more than um, uh, you know sixty questions which actually came in for the session um, so let me let me you know just ask you the two most interesting ones uh, mm -hmm. from there right so so one the first one is from uh, Meghna Joshi she's the founder of Swan Livelihood who wants to ask you what is the right stage to start thinking about getting investors on board. i think from the time you start thinking about doing your startup because mm. capital is a critical raw material for building any business not just a startup but for building any business and so along with what product what market what team you should start thinking about capital and uh, be thoughtful along with your business plan be thoughtful about a capital plan how much money will you need for what and when and what kind of money is it equity is it debt for most startups debt funding is not available although by the way i i think it is important to mention here there is a lot of initiative being taken by the industry as well as the government to create debt funding schemes for startups as well that do not require collateral or and have different requirements and they and they're willing to lend to not profit making enterprises without collateral but with a different kind of criteria so think about how much money you need for what what is your use of funds and when do you need it and start raising money almost a year before you need the money so if you're starting your business then obviously you're going to start with a seed capital that you're self funding or you've raised from friends and family but very quickly think about um, either organized platforms like let's venture angel list uh, there are various angel networks now and there are angel syndicates that are becoming active or if you have enough money to see you through then go into a straight into a sort of a seed or an institutional series a round I hope that answers your um, question, Meghna. Um, I have one last question for you, um, sure. Anjali. Um, so, you know, this is from Virendra Malu. He's the founder of Sharad Technologies, and this is an interesting one. Um, is a reference to meet with investors really a must? It helps. It does help uh, because investors get so much inbound. that uh, if it is coming through a trusted reference or a source or a friend or somebody in the network you will it does kind of give you a bit of a leg up um so yes if you can find a warm lead warm lead is better than a cold lead makes sense makes sense i hope that answers your question uh, virendra um so thank you for joining us today anjali i think uh, you know uh, you answered our questions so in such a crisp and clear manner i think it gives us you know a very good picture uh, from your perspective um uh, uh, thank you for sharing those rich insights uh, i'm sure it was very helpful for our audience here and thank you for having me i'm a big fan of amazon i'm a loyal customer i am amazon prime member for a long time <laughs> Uh, of all your products um big fan of what megna is doing i've known her for a while and ashish great to get to meet you and i wish we had your products and my children by younger and all the best to all the entrepreneurs on this session today and tai as always thank you and wonderful to be together with tai 
i'll take your leave thank you thank anjali you. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the next segment of our session, and I will introduce uh, our distinguished panel. Um, so we have with us here today Mary Gobrial, Director, uh, Marketplace Expansion, Middle East and uh, North Africa Marketplace. Mary leads the global selling program for the Middle East and North Africa region, empowering local entrepreneurs to sell globally. She also leads the 3P business for Saudi Arabia, which is the largest marketplace in Middle East and North Africa. As the chief commercial officer at souq.com, she led the re- regional retail initiatives across categories. Throughout her 25-year long career, she has worked across FMCG, entertainment and online shopping. She has been recognized as a young Arab leader and has also been nominated nominated for arab uh, arabic wo- uh, woman for us exchange welcome to the panel mary we are so happy to have you here with us today thank you so much i'm delighted and i'm honored thank you so much for having me Our next panelist is Meghna Narayan. She is the co-founder of Slurp Farm. Meghna is passionate about early childhood nutrition. She is committed to make a positive change to the health of children and families around the world by introducing traditional Indian grains to the global pal- uh, plate. Uh, before starting Slurp Farm, Meghna led the public health practice at McKinsey and Company. She holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, a BA in Computation as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, and a BE with distinction in In computer engineering from Bangalore University, Meghna was also a national level swimmer uh, for India for many years. She has won over 400 national gold medals and has represented India at the Asian Games. Welcome to the panel, Meghna. Happy to be here. Our third panelist is Ashish Ajmera, who is a co-founder of Jack in the Box Toys. He started this company along with his co-founder and wife Mudita Todi with a vision to build India's first global toy brand. Jack in the Box Toys was b- born out of a simple yet powerful insight that children are addicted to their gadgets purely because the non-digital toys available are not engaging enough. Today, Jack in the Box has delighted thousands of customers across 14 countries. A proudly women-run company, it supports 30 plus women from underprivileged backgrounds. Ashish, an alumnus of the Indian Business uh, School, Indian School of Business, Hyderabad, is a passionate entrepreneur. He loves evaluating and discussing business plans. Prior to this, Ashish has over 6 years uh, of experience donning various hats at reputed companies such as Accenture, Bharti Airtel and uh, A Mitra which is a funded startup welcome to the panel ashish very happy to have you here happy to be here uh, with such accomplished women uh, I've, i'm a proud customer of slurp farm so megna really nice to meet you very nice to meet you too thank you all right So so let's get started you know with the perspective that Anjali gave us I think I'm you know uh, getting into this discussion with a lot of excitement because I have a lot of questions which I'm hoping to get answers to and so is our audience so let me start with you Mary you know today we're talking about entrepreneurs and how they can build uh, global businesses having been an entrepreneur yourself right um, how have things changed uh, for you from your early days to now working for Amazon which also by the way you know uh, started just 25 years ago as a, a startup do you think more opportunities have opened up for entrepreneurs today uh sure so first of all i just want to say that um i i think i was born an entrepreneur so uh in my early days i actually uh i was brought up in nigeria and i started my first business when i was 2 years old i used to take the peanuts and wrap them on my own and go to the street and sell them and that's that's really an entrepreneur but then since then i moved on to do my own chocolate uh, bar restaurant and you know take lush cosmetics into the middle east uh, until i guess i started the real proper entrepreneurial uh, you know company with souk.com um and, and that's like more than you know 11 years ago and we started in a literally very small office um which was also the fulfillment center and also the warehouse everything was that in that office and we were all uh, clubbed together and and the, the spirit of us creating something new because really what we were creating was online business we were educating uh, not only the customers but also the brands of why they should sell online what does online mean um and and that passion and when you know every time we would go to a brand you know whatever that brand is like samsung and they would throw us out of the office and we would come back and like okay 
you know what, we're going to get this brand, we're going to get other brands. Uh, and I think that's really this entrepreneurial spirit that makes you nonstop go and go back and fight more and, and make it happen. And I think the key thing, the key difference here was that every time we would encounter a problem, here is where your entrepreneurial spirit comes. It's like, you know what, well, let's solve it. Let's create a payment solution. Let's create an ecosystem of delivery. Oh, we don't have, we only have cash on delivery. Okay, no problem. Let's create a cash on delivery company for the Middle East. Um, oh, well, you know what? No one heard of online. Oh, well, no problem. Let's create a huge event and call it White Friday in our region so people can know what about uh, online is. So literally, I feel that an entrepreneur is not necessarily just about starting your own uh, business, but it's also every single step of the way as you are in this business of how you constantly solve the problems by creating and innovating and scaling. And I think the big challenges that we faced as entrepreneurs was, you know, do we have money to pay our staff at the end of the month? Literally, that, that's really like, you know, in our mind, um, when we went on roadshows to, to raise funds, uh, that was really our concern. It's like, do we have enough money till the end? Do we have enough money to, to pay our drivers, to pay and so forth? Um, and that, that, that set of learning and that growth uh, scale is just uh, unprecedented and, and unbelievable. And then now fast moving, um, we kept that even within Amazon. I mean, yes, I, we are Amazon now, but I think um, we've kept that scrappiness. So at Amazon, we call it, you know, being scrappy. And every time we're bombarded by a problem, it's like, okay, put, put your, you know, entrepreneur hat on and let's solve it and let's, you know, let's make it happen. Uh, and that's, that's just great. That spirit is great. So all of you there, entrepreneurs, you've got something in you that no one else has and you should, you know, you should cherish it and make it happen and make it big. Um, so that's, uh, that's the key thing. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Mary. You know, I could uh, see some vigorous nodding from uh, Meghna and Ashish as you spoke about your experience. So uh, thanks for that. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to move on to you, Meghna. Uh, you started a brand, uh, you know, focused on mothers and kids along with your friend and, and also a mother, Shorvi Malik. Um, tell us a little bit more about your journey. Uh Thanks, firstly, for having us. Really nice to uh, hear your story as well. Uh, you know, I'm actually, I'm very excited to hear your story as well, Ashish. So uh, looking forward to that. I think, um, you know, it starts always with what is the problem that you wanted to solve, right? And for us, uh, you know, I used to run McKinsey's public health practice. Um, the numbers were all, the, the numbers were very clear, right? And not just in India. One out of, of course, in India, one out of every four children is at either malnourished or undernourished or obese. Uh, in the UAE, it's one out of every sort of three kids is uh, sort of obese, right? So I can sort of go country by country. Uh, the statistics are clear. The science is clear in terms of we have forgotten how to feed ourselves and our children. So something somewhere has gone wrong with our food systems and, uh, you know, that requires change. Uh, I think for both Shorvi and me, we had always wanted to do something together. This felt like, you know, if you're going to go and quit our job, which we were quite happy in, uh, it has to be a problem that's worth grabbing two hands with and then fighting for, for over, you know, a decade, two decades, right? So this felt like a, a problem worth solving. Um, and uh, we are very much, I would say, you know, in the beginning of this was, you know, building products for India and for that Indian mother, right? And uh, the answers, you know, lay sort of very much in our own grandmother's kitchens and so on. So we make a lot of porridges, uh, you know, uh, with traditional grains that, uh, like you said in your introduction with me, but basically with millets, right? So these are really, really uh, healthy grains that are not only good for us, they're good for the farmer, good for the planet. And really, you know, it, in the context that we're living in, and, you know, have we just sort of seen the first, in some ways, uh, you know, it, uh, gener intergenerational event, right? COVID has, was nothing short of that. Uh, we need solutions like this, which are going to, sort of help reverse some of the damage we've done to the planet. And um, for us, Slurp Farm was very much about that as well. So taking these grains, which are just so good, uh, you know, for the entire sort of world uh, to, to the rest of the world as well. Um, so, I, you know, I think that was, that was the intention. Uh, it's been four years. We started our journey with Amazon very much. You know, I think Amazon grocery was just starting in India. 
um, it was outstanding, right? Like, uh, I think even a decade ago, it was impossible as an FMCG brand to have national distribution on day zero. Uh, and Amazon afforded us that. Uh, you know, since then, there have been other online players, and we have sort of, I would say, ridden that wave very much so. Um, and, uh, you know, Shorvi was based out of London. She sh chose to uh, sort of move uh, to the UAE because uh, from, I would say, while we were building for India, the ambition was always to build a gro global brand out of India. This generation of entrepreneurs is not going to export commodities and import products. We're going to export brands, right? And we very much want to be that, you know, part of that uh, revolution. Great. Great. Thanks, Igna. I did not know the stats, uh, you know, are the way you stated. So definitely a big problem that you're solving here. All right. I'm going to come to you now, Ashish. You and your wife, Mudita, are partners and founders for Jack in the Box Toys, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about how the partnership at work is? Who is responsible for what? <laughs> so uh, I'll just give a quick introduction about what we do. Uh, so like uh, Meghna said, you know, it, it feels like people have forgotten to eat. Uh, we encountered a similar problem uh, and we said, you know, have people forgotten how to play? Uh, because we saw kids around us, my nephew, niece, uh, you know, always addicted to the iPad or, or any, uh, all, all the other gadgets. And we said, you know, this is not how we used to play. Like we used to ha have a lot more hands-on play and, you know, the touch and feel experience in today's play is missing. That's when we decided that, uh, you know, we should do something about this problem and come up with toys that uh, can give that sensory experience to children, but at today's, uh, uh, you know, attention span, which is typically very low uh, because of the increased usage of, uh, you know, uh, gadgets. So that's what Jack in the Box is all about. It started a few months only after our wedding. Uh, you know, she was in between jobs. She had just quit Google. Uh, and she was looking for something that is uh, creatively uh, satisfying. Uh, whereas I was, I just wound up a, a failed business. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was looking, looking for another idea that hopefully would not fail. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we both realized that we have very complementary skills. Uh, you know, while, while she's great at, at uh, creative and product design aspects, I'm, I'm good at the business side of things. Uh, and, you know, so that's when we decided to join hands. Um, and, uh, you know, for a, for a company like ours, which is in, in the toy space and typically arts and crafts, uh, the product design, uh, you know, is the soul of the company because a typical product has a life cycle of about two to three years. So it's, it's all about turning out the next new creative uh, uh, toy. Uh, so she pretty much, you know, uh, you know, holds the soul and the core of the company while we all are, all the other departments are evolving around it. Uh, and, you know, she comes up with her creative designs and it's, it's, it's my job to uh, take it to as many people uh, as possible. Uh, and, you know, that's where uh, Amazon has really helped us uh, reach out to different platforms and so easily. Uh, uh, and uh, apart from that, you know, I actually, I, I want to bring in this point as well. So recently somebody on Women's Day asked me that, you know, like what's the biggest value addition? Uh, and I say that, you know, uh, Modita brings in a lot of EQ into, into the business, a lot of emotional intelligence. Uh, you know, we all know now that what, what differentiates great leaders from good ones is, is the emotional intelligence. And there were many a times where, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pulling out my hair in frustration, dealing with the vendor or, or my employees. And, you know, she would <laughs> come in and give me, uh, some, uh, you know, EQ based, uh, solution on it. Uh, and that is really, really rubbed off on me, uh, to a point that now, uh, you know, it, it's showing amazing results uh, in our customer relationships, our vendor relationships, uh, our employee morale and productivity. Uh, so yeah, that's how we are. Great. Thank, thanks for that, Ashish. And you know, it's very interesting whenever you introduce your company, it's, you know, though it's 
led by you and Mudita, it's always introduced as a woman-led company. So that's great to, you know, get that perspective from you. And the EQ angle, yeah, I think uh, that's a very interesting uh, point that you've gotten here as well. So thanks for that. So I'm going to come back to you, Mary, now, uh, you know, to understand that how is Amazon working with entrepreneurs uh, to build global businesses? Sure. I mean, as you probably everyone knows that um, the Amazon overall globally, uh, and, and I, it was in many of the shareholders uh, reports, more than 65% comes from our sellers. And for me, every seller is in reality an entrepreneur. Uh, right, so he's someone who started his own business, or and the business could be have created your own brands like Megan and Ashish, and it's inspiring uh, hearing, you know, listening to you. I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna quit Amazon and go start my own business right now. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> um, no, but in reality, all of our sellers base are entrepreneurs, um, and our job at Amazon is to actually enable these entrepreneurs to, to grow. So what we do is we offer them everything so that they don't need to think of, okay, how do I, what is the, you know, what is the distribution channel? How do I export? How do I import? How do I send my product? Um, do I need to have my own uh, FC? Do I have like all of the problems? We remove it from the entrepreneur so that they are focused on really creating and solving our customers' problem as um, as we see. So and that's really our job. So the beauty of Amazon is that we're technology, right? So we provide you tools and tools at a scale that will take you from this small level to a global level in one go without additional capital upfront investment. Um, and hence the ROI of investing into becoming that entrepreneur on Amazon is huge and it's really removing all of the different frictions. But also more importantly, and particularly for this panel is that as you create your product, and I think it's important going back to, is this product for India only or is this product for a global product? And if it is for a global product, I mean, Amazon has, we're, we're launching very, very soon a product that's called, you know, you register once and you sell on Amazon globally. And that's the beauty. So you don't have to really worry about anything. It's just that you need to come up with that right product and you need to decide whether is this something for India only? And it, it could be just for India, but, you know, there's a lot of people who want those Indian products like we in, in the Middle East, you know, because Bollywood is so big, we aspire for the Indian, we know we want, you know, I mean, Tabakshan here. Uh, so so there, there is no harm if you're creating a product only for India, that that as it is would go globally. But then because you've got such a high skills and manufacturing creativity in India, I mean, like when I came, I'm inspired and impressed, then you could af absolutely create products for the entire uh, entire world. Um, and Amazon role is removing all of those frictions so that it enables you as just a creative person to easily grow. Um, and to the extent that obviously we also have our own lending program and this entire, um, you know, initiative that you guys are running by, you know, choosing the best ideas, choosing the best entrepreneurs and, and even giving them even more um, seed funds, let's say, so that they can start their own business. Thanks, Mary, for summarizing that. Uh, I, I think, I, you know, I was just thinking of a new tagline, in fact, like Amazon inspiring creativity <laughs> while we take care of everything else. So that's, uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. that's a good one. Thanks yes. thanks for that, Mary. Um, I'm going to come to you um, uh, now, Meghna. You know, you are, uh, you recently took your brand to global markets, right? Like Slurp Farm has gone international. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, digital first brands and, and your experience of going international with Amazon? Yes. So to, I think I'm going to split that into two pieces, right? Digital first and then going international. Uh, so I think we weren't digital first. You know, while we did launch on Amazon, in India, we had decided to go both online and offline because we felt a food brand should be available at the local store. And that anyway felt like a 10-year hike. So we said, you know, the quicker we start, the better it is, right? Uh, and then, of course, COVID happens and that sort of the whole strategy got uh, sort of, uh, you know, we re-looked at it. And thanks to that relook, it grew three, sort of we've grown three times in 2020 um, and decided to go global, right? Because uh, life's not sequential, you know, opportunities come uh, and, and we decided to sort of grab that with, with both hands. I think the key here is it's really hard to build a global one product, right? Even McDonald's, when they came to India and they made a tandoori burger, right? Because you're 
sort of, I mean, the beef burger was not going to work in, in this country. Right? So, um, uh, you know, so, you know, we have actually looked at our, we have 25 products in our portfolio. Mothers feed their children differently in, in different cultural contexts, right? So there are some products that will work, like our pancakes, for example, will sort of slide right into whether it's the UAE or the UK and so on. And the only difference is that, of course, instead of being made with a wheat or, a, 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 you know, or oats, this thing's made with millets. And that's a whole sort of there's that, that, that value addition. Um, and then there are other products which uh, in India we market as sort of wheat-free, maida-free, trans-fat-free, but they also happen to be gluten-free and vegan which sort of in the Indian market is not so deeply this thing, but those are, you know, so it's, it's the same product, just marketed differently in different countries. So I think you have to figure out, you know, which of your products you can take and the ones that you're taking almost like each market requires you to sort of, you know, do the, I, there's no secret, right? You have to do the work for each market separately, um, uh, you know, and to make sure that, you know, you are what the customer is looking for, right? What Amazon gives you is, that ability to, when people search for certain things, you should show up. So you've got to make sure that your, uh, your sort of product is checking the boxes for the, for the consumer. So I think for us, the, you know, I wouldn't say we perfected it by any means. We're in the, very much in the start of that journey where we're looking at market by market, which are the products we take. Should we build new products for some, you know, for, uh, and, and we're very much in, the, you know, in, the, in, in that mode as well. Of there are certain products that we might not launch in India, uh, at least not not immediately, but we launch in the UK, right? Um, and you know, what of that is transferable to the US? That's a whole different sort of party in its own way. So almost look at it market by market. What is the problem you're solving for the consumer in that market? Great. Uh, I hope all the entrepreneurs here who want to go global are listening. I think these are words of wisdom. <laughs> Uh, all the best to you, uh, Meghna, for, you know, the journey that you've started. Uh, I'm going to come to you now, Ashish. Uh, you know, we know that Jack in the Box uh, is, you know, it's already selling in so many countries, 14 plus countries, right? And and in the process, it's also enabling social impact, you know, in terms of creating jobs for women. Can you share how exports has opened up business opportunities for you and how it translates into downstream impact? You know, we are a proudly women-run company. Uh, about 90% of our workforce is uh, women. Uh, you know, we have tie-ups with a lot of NGOs uh, where, uh, you know, they help us, uh, uh, you know, rehabilitate uh, women, especially from uh, domestic abuse uh, backgrounds. And we feel really, uh, you know, satisfied when we when we are able to give them a source of income and rehabilitate them uh, in terms of uh, so yeah we do a lot of programs with these women uh, women as well like workshops uh, very basic things like uh, how do you uh, you know invest your money how do you open a bank account how do you create an fd uh, how can you insure yourself medical insurance life insurance etc these are very basic things which you'd be surprised that uh, you know the penetration with the workforce is near to zero uh, so we do regular workshops and you know the thing about uh, empowering or educating women is that you're educating them along have this influence on the job. You know, when you when you are uh, teaching a woman how to open a bank account, you know that knowledge is going to get transferred on to their kids, uh, or you teach them the value of saving uh, in into a bank account. They, that knowledge is going to get transferred on to their kids. Uh, in terms of downstream impact, you know, when we started out, uh, everything literally ninety nine percent of the Indian toy market uh, used to be imports from China. Uh, so there was there was no ecosystem present here, uh, no raw materials, no job work uh, vendors, nothing. But uh, you know, Mudita and I had uh, since the start we've been very stubborn about making a hundred percent made in India product, uh, and and because of that we had to work with a lot of vendors. Uh, you know, uh, sit at their uh, factories for hours together, uh, train them how they can make. Uh, products which are export worthy uh, 
and you know bit by bit uh, you know like mary said the uh, the capability is there it's just that uh, you know no one had uh, in, uh, told them that you know you need to make a certain standard of product that is export worthy and when they got exposed to that the the vendors responded really well and i can tell you proudly today there are a lot of vendors who are independently exporting uh, you know so that that gives us a lot of pride uh, of, of course uh, you know being a 100% made in india product uh, all the foreign remittances that comes into uh, our company stays within the country so uh, that's also something we are we are very proud of great great i think it's really inspiring to you know see the kind of social impact that your company is building as well and you know to uh, see this perspective i think it's it's it i hope it's it's inspiring the other entrepreneurs here uh, online with us today as well so thanks for that ashish uh, so i'm going to come to you and ask you you know the last question here uh, mary you know so what do you according to you what do you think uh, is the opportunity that exists for indian sellers today uh, in global markets um i mean the 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 key opportunity is that the indian sellers have products that we all want globally um and it's evident that just the india to ue arc and now recently india to saudi arc has been actually one of the most successful arcs that we have and um we have a great team in india that's sitting i mean obviously uh, led by you guys and and who advise our sellers on what is the product that they should sell um, how do they sell it what format is it on fba or is it just purely mfn because it does make a difference um, what is the right pricing how do they promote it what are the right events so you've got someone who's sitting there to help you and to assist you to make your product fit perfectly and maybe the product that you sell to saudi which is like i don't know hair because i've got long black hair is different than the product you know you will you send to the us um, and and so forth but you've got that team that has all of the data that can help you to tailor make um, where and what to send and in what format to send it um, and i mean again i go back to the indian products are not only liked by you know the indian communities that live everywhere around the world uh, but also you know i personally use a lot of beauty products from our indian sellers that are selling here in the uae um and i love it and it's inspiring so uh, the product is extremely extremely appealing um i think the other key advantage um of indian product is the pricing the value is there the pricing for money is there um The other one that we see that's a big difference is the language. I mean, when we go to China, although they're great as well entrepreneurs in China, unbelievable opportunity, but language is a big barrier and we don't see that barrier in in India. Uh, you guys are super smart, super well educated and, and everyone speaks better English than anyone else. So, I think that's another big opportunity that we have in India. And then the fourth is I feel that overall in india the the ecosystem the government amazon in india all of these are really supporting and encouraging that level of creativity and and the the industry itself and that's an unbelievable you know opportunity and and we learn from you and we see how we can take what india is doing and we can replicate in other market places so definitely you are leading the world in that aspect and uh, and we just want more and more indian products uh, on amazon globally Mary I'm sending my co-founder Shorvi to meet you. Yes, <laughs> She's in the right now. <laughs> yes, yes, please do, please do. Yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. I would love to meet her. Um I know she said she's here and I would love to meet her and get to know her. Thank you Mary for summarizing that. Uh, uh again, you know, I hope everyone's listening uh about the opportunity that uh, Mary has spoken about. Thank you for that Mary. Um I'm going to quickly, you know, uh, come to the last question for you Meghna and you know, um ask you that how how important is it really to have the right partner/mentor/network, you know, in the journey of building a business? I mean uh, sort of that's a question that you've answered almost in the question right this is absolutely 1000% important uh, both i think you know it's really nice to have uh, a co-founder in the journey some people choose to marry them but uh, shorvi and i are not married to each other but 
uh, you know, it's you know, it feels like my sister, right? Like we uh, we spend more actually we spend more time with each other than our spouses right now. So, <laughs> um, you know, uh, sort of between Zoom calls and uh, sort of team calls. Um, I think it's, you know, entrepreneurship is very hard, right? There's, and both, uh, you know, the, the journey in itself, it's a long one, it's a marathon and it's always, you know, it's like why you get married, right? Is because you all, or find a partner to sort of live life with because it's more fun with someone else. And, uh, you know, we're very different, um, but, you know, it, it has made this journey, both the highs and the lows better because, because I, you know, I have her with, her, with, with me on it. I, and not just her, right? I think, our team, right, that we're sort of building as we go along. Um, you know, there, there's some people who have been uh, with us right from the beginning. And uh, it's it's absolutely wonderful. Right? It's, it's family, to be honest. Uh, in terms of mentors, right, that's, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a 20-year-old uh, starting a business. Uh, I've had a full sort of career, right, at, uh, you know, at McKinsey. Um, and uh, sort of between... Uh, between sort of you know the journey of Slurp Farm and the and both our professional networks, there is almost never a case where there is a problem that I uh, not I I'm mostly I don't know the answer, but I know who can help me solve it, right? And uh, and, and you know what I have found is what is wonderful is that people are so uh, open with with their advice and and help. Um, that really it has been humbling through this journey. And uh, I always, you know, when people try to reach out to me on LinkedIn or whatever, I'm always trying to help because I feel so many people have helped me. It's my job to pay it forward. So absolutely. I think, uh, you know, so the whether, whether these are long-term mentors uh, for your business or, you know, people who give you sporadic advice, um, you know, I would say take time to both give and receive. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Meghna paid forward uh, that's a good one actually yeah all right coming to you ashish the last question to you uh, you know so uh, how are you thinking about expanding your workforce and how important is it you know to have a happy workforce so uh, you know, firstly to 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 megna's point of you know uh, marrying my marrying the co-founder i would like to tell her that when, when people ask me how is it I say it's like uh, have, uh, living with your boss 24 by 7. So, uh, no, but on a, on a serious note, uh, I think it worked out for both of us as we had really clear uh, demarcations in, in terms of what we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, coming to your uh, question. Uh, so, we are expanding our workforce, almost um, doubling our workforce year on year. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what I think is very important is, you know, empowering your people right down to the, you know, your labor workforce, right? So I, I, I'll explain in terms of an example, I think that would be better. Uh, you know, so our toy has a lot of small moving parts um, and it gets packed at different, different uh, steps. So, you know, typically 90 to 100 small moving parts uh, and the chances of some, uh, you know, and it's all manually packed. So the chances of an error, a human error is high. Uh, and, you know, we did a lot of things to try and reduce the defect rate, uh, put three levels of uh, QA, et cetera, all of that. And it, it, it helped, but only to a point. Uh, and then we came out with some something very interesting. Uh, so on a large screen, uh, you know, what we started doing was we started reading out our Amazon reviews to our workforce, uh, the bad ones, good ones, everything, and said, you know, and then we read it out saying when some customer said, uh, hey, you know, I didn't get this particular piece. Uh, and, and then suddenly, you know, the workforce uh, starts thinking that, you know, okay, my contribution is very trivial. I'm just putting this one piece into this box. But now suddenly they're thinking that, oh my God, it makes such a vast difference and it makes such a big impact that, uh, you know, the customers getting my companies, uh, um, you know, the name for my company or my, or the brand name is getting affected. And suddenly, you know, you see a different sense of ownership in them, right? And, uh, you know, believe you me, uh, in, in a matter of about two or three months, 
uh, we saw the defect rate going, uh, you know, almost halving. So uh, that that made a huge impact. So I think empowerment uh, to down to that level is very very important. Um, of course, ap apart from that, we have uh, R and R, and you know, we have Navratri dances and things like that um, to keep our um, uh, workforce motivated. Great, that's a very interesting one, Ashish. Uh, I think you know, uh, here at Amazon, we didn't know that you know uh, our reviews are also you know leading to this kind of an empowerment. So that's definitely very innovative. So thank you for that. Great so idea. I. So thank you to all the panelists, you know, for sharing this perspective with us uh, today uh, and the audience here today. Uh, I would now like to open the you know, forum for questions. And, you know, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, we have certain questions selected, uh, you know, from the questions which came in. We had like more than 70 questions which had uh, come in. And we're going to quickly wrap it up so that, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, wrap it up in the next five minutes. I'm going to ask one question from the audience. So the first ones to you, uh, Mary. Uh, it's an interesting one. It's from Avinash Saraf. Uh, he's the founder of Zendishin. He's asking, um, how can exporting be made as easy as opening a bank account? Um, it's actually as easy as in a bank account. So that's, a, that's an interesting analogy. So if you come to think about it, when you go to open, when you go to the bank to open a bank account, uh, you basically, you register your name, you just need your certificates, right? Whether it be your passport or your ID or whatever, so that we know that this is who you are. Um, and that's literally all what it takes for you to register on our Global Seller Central, literally. Your name and your, you know, your, your trade certificate or your ID, depending whether you're registering as an individual or a business. And then um, you meet in the bank with your account manager. And that's also what you could do. You can meet with your account manager, literally, who would then advise you on, you know, what type of bank account you need to open. Is it FBA or MFN? So very, very similar. Um, you know, what? how much capital do you need to put in your bank account? So open it with a minimum of X. And that would be, you know, that's the amount of inventory that you should put at the beginning, or that's the amount of selection or product that you would put. So extremely, extremely uh, similar to that. And then you start actually transacting with the bank right so the bank will take it on your behalf they would do everything they would invest in different things and then you can you get an interest back and and you are able to withdraw that cash on the spot and that's again as a seller you've got your bank account we have accs which is our own internal exchange uh, rate company so if you're selling in the us or you're selling in the ue we will do the exchange on your behalf you don't need so the bank is doing the forex for you uh, and then you can withdraw your, your, your funds anytime you want. You've got your card. You go on Seller Central. You take your revenue at any point of time. And we take a tiny, tiny commission fee. So it's literally actually a bank account. Uh, uh, that's a very interesting. Uh, and hopefully you will become richer. I know just to tell you. Um, so Eric Brossard is the, the leading of the international um, uh, marketplace for Amazon. And he always says one, one thing only. He's like, you know what? We go to a seller and say, you can be rich today with Amazon. And that's true, right? Like you are, you can be rich today with Amazon. And, and so your bank account manager will always tell you, you know, put this money in our bank and you'll be rich. And, and that's really the, the, the real story. You can only be, I believe that you can only really be very rich with Amazon. Wow. Thanks for that, Mary. I think beautifully put, uh, like everything had an, had an analogy. Like when the question came and I was like, okay, maybe a tough one, but uh, you've handled it like a pro. Thanks for that. I'm going to quickly move on to you. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to ask this to you, Ashish. Uh, all right. So Deepak Deshpande, he's the CHRO and a senior VP of Entity Net Magic. Uh, he's asking a rather broad question. Uh, it says, you know, what are the fundamental shifts that have taken place in the entrepreneurial world due to COVID-19? I would just like to add to the previous question that uh, I think it was Avinash, right? Uh, from the time I decided, and this is in 2017, from the time I decided to get on to Amazon Global to the time my products were live on the platform in a US warehouse, it took me only seven days. Uh, so I I think that's faster than opening a bank account. Uh, yes. <laughs> so coming, coming to... Uh, COVID-19, uh, I think there are, there are a lot of fundamental shifts that have uh, happened, you know, um, this, this, I mean, the smaller ones, if I would name, uh, like we are more comfortable working in a remote environment uh, that happened in my company, but 
to me the the most important change that has happened is that uh, companies and startups have started uh, looking at cash flows very importantly um, you know cash flow management is extremely extremely important and you know with the with the whole startup uh, um, you know uh, euphoria etc people generally tend to focus on the top line bottom line but uh, they need to equally focus on the cash flows we all know that you know uh, most of the companies that went bust during covid 19 were because you know they could not handle their cash flows and the guys who had strong cash flows could you know really maximize capitalize once the the economy is opened up so that to me has been the one of the biggest uh, fundamental changes thanks thanks for that uh, ashish okay the last question i think we'll wrap it up in the next 2 minutes is to you uh, meghna it's from uttam uh, umesh uttam Ch- chandani he's a director of uh, dev accelerator private limited he's asking how do you maintain a common product line across different countries uh, so we don't is the answer uh, you know we uh, i mean the, yes there are some products that you know are uh, transferable if you w- wish across the across the world uh but they're all marketed differently depending on the market uh not all products that are built for india can go global uh and that's all right uh you know the way an indian mother feeds her baby is slightly different so, um uh you know i think uh, you know to try and create a product that's sort of global i mean then you know we're not making an, a phone i guess so got it so the short answer is you don't so thanks for that uh, uh meghna uh, so i think with that we come to the end of this panel discussion i would again like to thank all our panelists uh, here today uh, mary um, ashish meghna thank you so much for joining us today i indeed enjoyed the conversation thank you for your rich and, and uh, insights which came in from all of you i would also like to thank the people who joined us digitally i'm sure uh, everyone in the audience would go away with this panel with a lot of knowledge insights and inspiration to go global so thank you everyone uh, and have a great day thank you everyone see you soon thank so you much thanks a lot thanks, thanks you. bye bye ashish bye